welcome to Red Reviews, the podcast where we talk about a variety of books uh, with a Marxist and anarchist perspective. And I'm joined by my co-host, Justin Clark. Thanks for joining me, Justin. Hi, Corey. It's good to be here, man. Excited to, to do another episode. Really digging the new background we've got, which yes. is fantastic. Um, that, that was that was Anya, right? She did yeah. that? Ina Nice Mangos over on from the Polite Conversations podcast. She is a graphic artist and she's our... fantastic. I recently yeah. I listened to your interview with her, which was good. And I also listened to her her interview on the the Left Racketing podcast. The guys who used to do the show with Michael Brooks and that was also very good about kind oh, yeah. of the the sort of death of new atheism, which we'll get a little bit into tonight. I think that'll probably be sort of an adjacent topic talking about this book. Um, but yeah, no, it looks great. I'm really happy with it. I think it's really cool. So thank you so much for putting that together for us. Yep, for sure, eh? Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, one other thing I did want to mention, and this might be a little like dated when you do like the full edited version, but I saw somebody on one of our comments, like I think on one of our recent episodes talking about like us commenting on um, what's going on in Gaza. And so I just wanted to kind of start with the discussion of that a little bit. So today, sure. um, I made a post about this on my Instagram. Um, today was the Indiana primary. So I live in the state of Indiana. It was the Indiana Democratic primary today. And um, so there's a very big, large, there's a large uncommitted campaign to Joe Biden um, that's going on in the state. So people voting explicitly uncommitted in different states to sort of show their, their very much displeasure and frustration with him on on the issue of gaza and uh i you don't have an option to do that in indiana you can't vote uncommitted but okay. you can leave it blank ah. um which is what i did um yeah. and so uh because there were other candidates i wanted to vote for in the primary who were good and i wanted to vote for them but i also who are local but i did not want to vote for him um, right and i basically made the point of saying that like the biden administration has been an utter failure in terms of letting this unmitigated you know, genocide uh, uh, against um, yeah. people in Gaza and some in the West Bank, because there have been there have been people who have been killed in the West Bank too. Um, and you know, as I mentioned in my post, I mean, of course, the October seventh attacks by Hamas were atrocious and awful and horrible. Right? It's a horrible loss of life yeah. and wrong. And and you know, but at this um, point. We're but at looking this point, at, we're looking at it, yeah. Like 40,000 dead in, in Gaza, Palestinians? Exactly. Like, we're looking at 40,000 dead, I think over 78,000 injured. It's wildly disproportionate. And it's a truly, it's a human rights tragedy. And I think that the Biden administration, you know, could have done something about it. And they didn't. Um, yeah. And part of that is because I think that Joe Biden is probably the most probably full-throated Zionist president we've had in a long time. I mean, this is a guy who, who said on the US, in, in the, when he was a U.S. senator that, you know, if, if Israel didn't exist, we would have to invent it. Yeah. You know, and so I think, you know, um, so I made a point of saying, that, like, no, I think people should vote uncommitted or keep it blank or not vote at all. Um, and I think that um, people should make their displeasure known because this is wrong. Um, and I also just wanted to sort of, say that I am in deep solidarity with all of the, the young, wonderful young people around the country and around the yeah. world who are protesting these egregious actions by Israel um, against the people of Gaza, because it's not a war like at this point, right? Like they're not, no. it's not a war. It's, it's, I mean, this is basically an ethnic cleansing. This is a genocide is, you know, war is supposed to be proportional, right? That's, you know, there are supposed to be international rules about how you, you, instigate wars and this is not following any of those protocols it's a human rights tragedy and so um i think that it's uh you know where are all the the, the free speech assholes right you know, where are all those people who talk yeah. about we believe in the right to free speech and this you know where's dave rubin on this right where's where's good old sam harris on this where's you know where are these people right yeah. um and so i think that um you know, we we live in a society where if you are like um, a uh, white supremacist and you're holding a white supremacist rally, the cops will probably protect you. But if you're on the left, you'll probably get beat up. I mean, that's usually how it goes. Right. So it goes to show you who's on like, you know, who's which side that the, the police are on or whatever. 
But yeah. Um, but yeah, so I just wanted to mention that because I think it's very important that we make that point um, early on and make a point of, you know, un- un- unequivocally, um, you know, condemn what's going on in Gaza. I think it's horrific. Yeah. And I don't think it has anything to do with combating terrorism. It has nothing to do with combating the the the, the actions by Hamas. It's all about yeah. finishing the project. The, yeah, I find it hard to imagine that it has anything to do with, like, targeting any leader of Hamas or anything like that when the it seems so clearly indiscriminate like there's nothing like even if you think that Hamas is bad then this is still not that <laughs> it's still just killing of innocent people yes yes it is and i and i think that it's it's sad because and people always say well why do we make such a point of it it's like well because yeah, and this is something a, a great point that Chomsky makes, which is that well, it's my government funding it. It's my government weaponizing it. It's my government doing it and yeah. basically giving it approval. Um, and you know, and and it looks like uh, you know, it looks like they're gonna be going into Rafa pretty soon, which Biden had said was a red line that if they were gonna go into Rafa, something else would happen. Um well we all know what red lines mean when they're talked about by presidents. They're total bullshit. They don't yeah, mean anything. They don't mean anything. Um, and so, you know, um, and so I think it's, uh, I think it's really sad that we live in a culture that just basically completely discounts, um, Palestinian lives and just doesn't count them as fully human. And that's yeah. pretty much the situation that we live in. And I think it's gross. And I think that the weaponization of, um, anti-Semitism for cynical purposes yeah. is equally egregious. It's horrific to, um, you know, lump in right wing, awful white supremacist terrorists who do attack synagogues and do attack Jewish people and have done that recently, right? Like it's very clear yeah. um, that most of the violence against Jewish people in the United States is done by right wingers. It's not done by the left. It's not done yeah. by people who are pro Palestine. Um, and uh, and I think that every time that they sort of do this cynically, I think it's an insult to um, to the Jewish people. I think it's an insult to those whose lives were lost in in pogroms and in the holocaust i think it's a disgrace and i think that it shouldn't be controversial to say those things no, and and so yeah uh, i just wanted to mention that for the person who commented because i think it's a good point um i think sometimes on our show we tend to we tend to talk about things in a more abstract way or sort of a more theoretical yeah. way and i i do want to just mention that there are real stakes here and that um i do think that over time i do believe and I have hope that um, that the, the 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 rights of Palestinians will ultimately be we we won that that, that you know because ideally you know what we would do is is what Edward Said called for years ago which we talked about in our episode on his book was yeah. you know one state solution this two state solution is dead like that's not happening right. what really needs to happen is an, as a one state solution which is prevent provides complete and equal political social and economic rights to both Palestinians and Israelis yeah. Um, that's the solution. And so, you know, we, uh, you know, you know, there's a ceasefire proposal on the table. Palestinians have already accepted it. The U.S. has helped sort of call that into into play to sort of orchestrate that and, and arrange some of that. And of course, the Netanyahu government's like, no. Yeah. Um, you know, so I think it's very important to see who who's the real problem here now. Who's the aggressor here? Who's the aggressor here now? And it's clearly the Netanyahu government. And yeah. so I am. Um, yeah, so I uh, I just wanted to mention that at the top of the show and yep. talk about these are the problems that happen when you have ethno religious nation states. That that's yep. kind of the problem, right? Because it's the same problem with Iran, it's the same problem with Pakistan, it's the same issue that we've had in Israel, which is, is what happens when you when you take religious sort of uh, religious and ethnic um, conceptions and then m- meld them to the nation state and how that's really bad. Yep. Um, and how secularism is the way of building democracy and human rights um, and and equality. That's you know, and ideally that's what would happen. Um, but uh, but you know, uh, I think that there are a lot. But I but I I have a lot of love for the protesters and the young people who are fighting for the rights yeah. of Palestinians. They are they are fighting a moral revolution. You know, it's 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 then and that they are in the they are the heirs to those who fought against Jim Crow in America and apartheid in South Africa, because it is apartheid in, 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 in Israel. It just is. Yep. yep. Um, 
So anyway, I just wanted to start off with that at the top because I think it's important that we do that. For sure. No, that sounds uh, like a good good thing to make clear. I get, like you say, like I was just listening to something uh, earlier today talking about about the protests at the various schools and the crackdowns on them and some of the bullshit that's coming out of like uh, authority figures and police and 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 that and like these are entirely you know peaceful protests but they're being framed as violent protests by out, organized by outside agitators and I mean it's the same old line right like they cannot accept yeah. that power is wrong. And so they have to keep cracked down on those who dissent. So, well, I, you're absolutely right. And this reminds me of a clip of, of New York Mayor, Mayor Eric Adams, truly one of the most horrific scumbags on the planet, um, talking about, well, they all have the same tense. It's like, it's like coordinated. Or whatever. <laughs> like, these are the rantings of like a conspiracy theorist. Like, if, yeah. if someone was saying this stuff on YouTube, they would be laughed at. But when it's a public figure saying these things, they're sort of given that sort of veneer of respectability. Yeah. Um, and that's essentially Somehow what people are doing. Seriously. Where they say it's China. They say it's Russia. They say it's China again. They say it's you know, Hamas. They say it's Soros. They say it's something. Like, they can never they can never grapple with the fact. They always think it's some outside thing because they can't grapple with the fact that America has deeply, deeply moral structures built into it and ones that right. it supports overseas. And they don't want to grapple with that because the moment they grapple with that, then they have to start challenging assumptions of what what the US government really is. And and they don't want to do that. Because as no. we talked about last time, you know, if you challenge assumptions, you will be punished. And if you celebrate yep. assumptions and accept assumptions, you will be rewarded for it. No matter how wrong they are. No matter how wrong they are, right? Think of somebody like Jeffrey Goldberg, who runs The Atlantic now, right? This is a guy who who yeah. probably proffered the most damaging conspiracy theory of the early 20th or 21st century, that Saddam Hussein had connections yeah. to Al-Qaeda. Yeah. Like, that's a lie. Like, it's, a, it's bullshit. It's not true. But it, it, but it didn't challenge, like, but it was affirming all of the basic assumptions of American empire. And so he got rewarded for it by becoming editor-in-chief of The Atlantic. Yeah. Um, and again, it's I think that's really indicative of the world we live in, which is so like the leadership of America and a lot of the political class are so divorced from reality. They like to talk about how like the MAGA people are divorced from reality and they are to a certain extent for sure. But like, yeah. but like the Biden people and like the elite liberal media, like they're also sort of disconnected from reality too. Yeah. And, uh, and that's why it's imperative that people call out their nonsense when they say stupid stuff. Yep. Absolutely. I guess uh, before we get into our book, uh, mm -hmm. some random geek had one quick question. Would you say that fascism is happening right now under Biden? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, yeah, I would. And and mainly just be, and it's not necessarily all about him. I think it's right. He is a part of a broader structure, right? So um, I just read a really interesting um, article from Rick Perlstein about Jeff Charlotte, who's the guy who wrote about the family, that the, sort of this weird religious organization that is sort of weaving its way into American government about 20 years ago. Well, Jeff Charlotte has a new book or a newer book, newish book out about like the sort of the emerging sort of civil war in America, that there's this very large divide between certain types of people. Um, and yeah, I think it's fair to say that there are huge amounts of people uh, in my country, in the United States, who are fascist. Um, and that's a tradition that goes back all the way to at least to the 1930s, right? I mean, you know, when the American Nazi Party had its rally at, at Madison Square Garden with thousands attended, right? Yeah. Um, and the America First movement, which kind of had connections to that. Um, and then you have the American Nazi Party in the 60s when it was led by Lincoln Rockwell. Um, so, yeah, there's always been fascistic elements. I think in terms of what makes this moment new is that we're seeing a broad breakdown of both democratic institutions and sort of liberal modes of, of, of um, thought and action in relationship to capital, right? So like, you know, China is a country that is basically capitalist. It's state capitalist, right? We can yeah. call it socialism, but it's essentially state capitalist. And it was sort of assumed after the end of the Soviet Union that 
you know, it's the end of history, right? That like liberal democracies and capitalism go together. You have to have one and to have the other. Right. What we've learned over the last 30 years is that's not true, that you could have a deeply authoritarian government and then connect that to an incredibly um, uh, rapacious authoritarian in its own right form of capitalism, right? Like, they, For sure. you know, and I think that's kind of what's in China. I think that's to a certain extent what's in Russia. And I do think in a certain extent, it's what's in the United States that um, yep. the, 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 the sort of the power structures are learning that they no longer need to follow these sort of norms of liberal democracy. They can just sort of jettison them um, and in the pursuit of, of continued um, capital accumulation and power accumulation. Yep. Um, so, yeah, I would say that, uh, you know, you know, I think that, I mean, Trump is a fascist. I, I mean, I, I'm very OK with saying that Trump is a fascist. Um, is Biden is a fascist? I don't know. I mean, you could make the argument that he is, but like, I, I think it's, but yeah. it's harder to make that argument than it is with Trump because the it thing about, feels yeah, true. that feels true. <laughs> that feels true. I don't true, know if I right? can make the case logically, but it feels true. It feels true. <laughs> and I think one of the ways that we can think about it is thinking about it, not in terms of specific actors, but thinking of it in terms of broader trends. Yeah. And I think in that regard, I do think that America is is becoming increasingly authoritarian and non-democratic yeah. and sort of jettisoning, jettisoning liberal principles, broader, small L liberal principles um, to protect capitalism, because that's yeah. what it'll do. I mean, liberals will often almost always side with the fascists yeah. uh, against socialists and communists to protect the system. Um, and we see this time and time and again. Um, so, yeah, I do think we're living in a deeply authoritarian moment, not just in the United States, but around the world. Um, and I think it's just the result of the breakdown of the political order of neoliberalism um, that has collapsed. Um, so and something else will replace it. Yeah. Oh, we got a we got a few people uh, with us today. Uh, oh, great. Uh, some people who haven't commented in the past. We've got uh, Travis Button. Thanks for joining us. Well, hello. Thank you. Uh, we got Moth Wings. Thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you so much. Appreciate it. And Glad Velkin, Velkin nine 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 uh, showed up. So. Oh, you're not too late. We were we were sort of talking <laughs> about some current things, um, and then we'll be getting into the book here soon. Yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, no, it's it's yeah. I think we're living at at, a, at an impasse. Um, you know, and uh, excuse me. Um, that's that great. You know. Uh, uh, Gramsci quote, right? You know, that the, the, the past is dead. Future is yet to be born. Now is the time of monsters. Um, and, uh, and I think that's right. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think that's a fundamentally correct, right? So, Almost an understatement. <laughs> yes, it is kind of an understatement. So yeah, I mean, I think, and I think especially when it comes to Biden, and this will be my last point, is that all of the things that people said would happen under Trump have also happened under Biden. You know, there's still yeah. kids in cages on the border. There's a humanitarian crisis in Gaza. There's, um, you know, we're fighting a proxy war in Europe. Like all this stuff that people were worried about with Trump. It's yeah. ha a lot of it's happening under Biden, yeah. okay. which goes to show you that it's kind of bigger than Trump and or Biden, although they are certain, certainly large contributors to it. But it's part of larger social forces of the breakdown of the sort of neoliberal order. Yeah, I uh, I'm reminded of like uh, uh, Cody Johnston of uh, the Some More News. Mm. Uh, YouTube channel and podcast. Yeah. Uh, he tweeted something about saying like, uh, if the if the other team was in power, like, what would your reaction to these things be? Oh right. And, it, <laughs> and it's like, yeah, of course, like exactly. And I think that's it. And I and I, I think it goes to show you that how much of American politics breaks down to teams of yeah. like, well, I'm on the blue team versus the red team. The, the beauty of being a leftist is that I don't care about either one of those teams. Exactly. They mean nothing to me. So, um, you know, I mean, one, in my opinion, one is objectively worse than the other. I do think that the Republicans are worse yeah. for a myriad of reasons, but that doesn't mean that like the Democrats are off the hook because they're pretty fucking terrible too. And a lot yeah. of times their condi their decisions and their policies led to the Republican party becoming worse. Yeah. And it's like, it's kind of like a snake eating its own tail. Like it just kind of gets worse over time. For sure. I guess with that, what book are we covering today? <laughs> so tonight, um, you know, so this is, um, this was a book that I, I thought about, um, writing about and then 
And then I decided, well, no, it actually might be good for the podcast. So, um, so this year is the 25th anniversary of um, Stephen Jay Gould's book, Rocks of Ages, um, Science and Religion and the Fullness of Life. Um, and I think this is a very important book. Um, I think it's one of Stephen Jay Gould's more important books because I think it's the one of, of besides his own work in paleontology and evolutionary biology, which is what he he his stock and trade was. He was a paleontologist. Um, outside of his own scientific achievements, which were many, um, I think his largest cultural impact came with this book. Um, right. And so there have been a lot of reflections lately on sort of taking the a sort of post-mortem on um, new atheism. And I think Jacobin just recently released their new issue of their magazine, which kind of goes into some of this. I think Nathan Robinson wrote a piece about it. And people have been talking about, of course, Corey, you did your, your great episode with, with Ina about some of this. Um, yeah. And I think that um, one of the, the sort of um, frustrations that the new atheist often had was with Stephen Jay Gould, who himself was an atheist. He was a secular person. But he was also somebody who wasn't like an anti-theist. He wasn't against right. religion in, in, in that sense. And so um, this is a book that I feel like is, it's one of those books where it's like people reference it and then like people like like castigate it or castigate its ideas, but have never really read it. And that's kind of right. the impression that I get. Uh, uh, so uh, yeah. I'm not sure. Is this, it, he, he talked about uh, the idea of non-overlapping -la magisteria. Right? Yes. Yes. So <laughs> that's that's why he's not liked by the new atheist community. <laughs> bingo. So <laughs> in Rocks of Ages, um, which as we mentioned in the pregame, a lot of people get the name wrong. They often just call it Rock of Ages. I've even seen books cite it like that. Um, the Respectable Atheism book that we did on this show cites it wrong. Right. Um, and uh, I've seen other books cite it wrong. But yes, it's this concept of Noma, no, non-overlapping magisteria that science and religion belong in two separate spheres and that um, when one or the other sort of hits up against its own turf, they should back off. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, uh, so like the new atheists like hated this, like Dawkins hated it. Um, Sam Harris doesn't like it. And then Jerry Coyne wrote a whole book refuting it, um, right. which is called faith versus fact. Um but I think the big issue is that a lot of the new atheists sort of think about religion in the way that fundamentalists do, and they don't ex they don't kind of explore the nuances of what religion actually is, um, or what moral thought actually is. Because like in in the book, because like my big criticism of like Noma was like, well, where does philosophy fit in this? Mm -hmm. You know, because philosophy is not quite science, but it's not really religion. Where does it fit in the Noma sort of sphere? Right. And he makes a point of saying that, no, philosophy is part of the, the sort of religion morals component of it. Right. And so there's science and there's sort of religion slash philosophy slash ethics. Like it's that. Okay. And so, um, so he has a quote in the book. This is early on in the book that kind of gives you a sense of where he's coming from. It's where he gets the title of the book. So um, to summarize with the tad of repetition, the net or magisterium of science covers the empirical realm. What is the universe made of? Fact. And why does it work this way? Theory. The magisterium of religion extends over questions of ultimate meaning and moral value. These two magisteria do not overlap, nor do they encompass all inquiry. Consider, for example, the magisterium of art and the meaning of beauty. To cite the old cliches, science gets the age of rocks and religion the rock of ages. Science studies how the heavens go, religion how to go to heaven. What he's arguing here for is a clear delineation between what is science and what is religion. And trying to make the argument that when science tries to kind of step on religion's toes, it causes problems. And when religion tries to step on science's toes, it causes problems. Right. What he's arguing for here is not that different from the separation of church and state. So in the United States, we have the First Amendment. We do have the separation of church and state for now. But, uh, but, um, but uh, you know, as we've talked about in the episode where we talked about Andrew Seidel and the awful right wing takeover of yeah. the Supreme Court. But ostensibly, in theory, in the United States, we have 
freedom of religion and separates church and state. And, the, and that's for a reason. It's not just to protect the state from abuses of religion. It's to protect a religion from abuses of the state. Yeah. If you have if you have a state that favors one religion, then every other religion is screwed. So <laughs> I don't see why people would be mm -hmm. like, you know, against a secular state myself. Exactly. And I think that's kind of what he's arguing for here. He's trying to make a clear delineation between what we think of as being science, what we think of as being religion. And so throughout the book, he sort of talks about how um, there's a long history of this and how religious leaders from, you know, people like, um, what's his name, uh, you know, like Thomas Burton uh, or Thomas Burnett, rather, um, he wrote a book in the 17th century called The Sacred Theory of the Earth. Um, and, you know, and so he's, he's kind of a guy of this where it's like, where, um, he, he kind of fits into the sort of foundational history of the beginnings of science. So Burnett is kind of contemporary of people like Isaac Newton, Edmund Halley, you know, um, uh, Boyle, Hook, Ray, Burnett himself, who were as much religious as they were scientists, scientists. Like, so for example, Isaac Newton, right? Like what people don't often know about Isaac Newton is that he wrote far more about religion than he did about science and spent most of his life thinking about questions of religion than thinking right. about physics. Um, and, and so there was this, this attempt to sort of reconcile these two things and sort of recognizing like, these are the things that we grant to the religious sphere, and these are the things that we grant to science. And so a lot of times the the, the sort of the guys who are part of the, the scientific revolution, they would they would make the argument of sort of God is sort of the imperial clock winder, as as um, as Gould calls it, um, you know, who sort of gets the universe going. And then everything after that about how we know of how it works, we leave to science. Um, and so. It's your yeah. first mover or whatever. Yeah, prime mover thing. And this is very common with like the deists of like the 18th century. So people right. like Thomas Paine and Thomas Jefferson and Voltaire and others who kind of make the same argument. Um, well, part of the reason why I think this book is interesting is because I think his argument's right. Um, I do have issues with it, though. Mm. Um, I, I don't think it's perfect. Um, right. And we'll get into that. But I do think fundamentally, I think as a as a point of how we go about our investigations of science and religion, I think it's a healthy way of thinking about it. Um, the way that the new atheists think about it, or at least some of them do, is that um, religion often makes claims about the earth. It often makes claim science specific sort of fact based claims about the earth. Right. Um, and. That's true, right? So biblical fundamentalists, I mean, people who think that the earth is 6,000 years old, um, yeah. who, you know, they, they, that's a, that's a fact-based statement, right? And it's one that not even most Christians even believe in, let alone right. Catholics. Um, and Catholics who tend to be the most liberal on these kinds of questions, not just in America, but at the, at the highest levels in terms of the Vatican. And we'll get into that in a bit. But, um, but I do think it's an important question, which is like, well, there are times where you know, religion's going to make specific fact claims. I mean, it's, yeah. you know, when it says, when you make a claim like Jesus will, you know, was die, died on a cross and then was resurrected after three days, like that's a specific claim, right? Yep. And you can say, well, it's a faith-based claim, but it's like, that is a factual claim. It's not a moral claim. There's nothing moral about making the argument. There's nothing about yeah. morality or ethics about, you know, Jesus dying being dead for three days and then coming back like this there's that's a very specific claim of the supernatural right yeah. yeah now i think the way that we extend noma is more beyond more than mere morality component because i think that's where where gould kind of gets tripped up because i think mm. religion is more than morality right and it's because it does make very specific claims about certain things yeah so i think the way that we extend noma is thinking of these things as being supernatural. They are not of the natural. They are beyond science. Science cannot comment on specific religious claims, 
precisely because they're outside of the traditional realms of science. And this is kind of what Thomas Henry Huxley makes a point of saying in one of his letters, who was Thomas Henry Huxley, who was known as Darwin's bulldog. He was one of the big, he was an English biologist who was a popularizer of Darwin's ideas. Um, he sort of makes a point of saying um, that uh, in a, when he's talking about like the immorality, like the immortality of the soul, he says like, I neither def def deny nor affirm the Im immortality of man. I see no reason for believing it in it, but on the other hand, I have no means of disproving it. Mm. I think mm -hmm. that's true, right? Like I think supernatural claims, like if someone make, wants to make a supernatural claim, you can sort of, in a sense, maybe lightly debunk it. In the sense of like, you can make it, like you can make the argument, well, like, do we have any evidence of somebody coming back after three years? Right. Right? Like dead people don't often come back to life. Like, do you have any like testimonies about that or, you know, or kind of evidence about that more than just, well, that's what the Bible says. Right. Um, but, uh, but at the same time, I think that it's, it's important <clears throat> to note that, um, that again, these are still like, I guess it just counts on what you think of as being a scientifically verifiable fact. Like right. to me, like the immortality of the soul is not a physical conception. It's a metaphysical conception. It's a philosophical. Yeah. Conception. Like it's there isn't of, a physical thing that you can show even is a soul. So talking about its immortality, this has to be like a conceptual thing. Exactly. It's kind of like, what does blue smell like? <laughs> right. Like it's, you know, it, yeah. it's, you know, yeah. um, and I, it's like, you but can make that statement. Because, even worse because you can see blue, mm -hmm. <laughs> but you can't even, you don't know anything about the soul. You can make all kinds of claims about it. Exactly. And I think that that is, that's what, what Gould is trying to get at is if we have this sort of notion of Noma, where we separate these out, that we can kind of, kind of skirt the issue a little bit and kind of let people kind of have like, here's your religious part of your brain. Right. Here's your scientific part of your brain. Sometimes you might reconcile the two, but a lot of times those are going to be two different things that you don't reconcile yeah, because yeah. you can't, it's kind of impossible to. And the trouble happens when I think for both sides, like I think for Christians who, or religious people of any type who try to like prove their religion true through science, I think that's a, I think that's a, a fool's errand. I don't think that's something you should do right? because it's not what religion's about. It's not really what, that's not really what its goal is. Yeah. And I think on the other hand, I think that the sort of the, the, the sort of new atheists or the, the sort of radical secularists who are anti-theistic and they want to sort of like show, well, everything about religion is bullshit. It's like, well, now you're kind of overstepping your bounds because like you can't necessarily prove or disprove some of these things. There's right. not a, there's not a, it's not a scientifically verifiable, like you said, the soul is not a scientifically verifiable concept. Right. Like it's just a, an idea, right? It's like, a concept that yeah, people believe in, right? Yeah. And, and the thing is, is that like, like money is also just kind of a concept that we believe in. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. But it, inf but it informs what we do, right? Like, yeah. uh, in the sense that, you know, I believe that money is real. I believe that money has value. When I go into a store and I use my money to buy something, I expect to, that money to work. Like we are all, all, every day, all of us are sort of making those sort of tiny leaps of faith about certain things. Cause that's just the way life is like, yeah. but at the same time, um, you know, there's certain leaps of faith that are maybe unacceptable. And I think some are unacceptable in science. I don't think trying to understand what the soul is, is, is the, is the prerogative of science. I just don't any more that I don't think that, uh, you know, I don't think it's the prerogative of science to tell us how we should live. Um, you know, and this gets us to the, the induction problem or the is ought problem well, of yep. the philosopher, David Hume, you cannot yep. derive an ought from an is he's right. You know, is, is in, can inform oughts. Sure. So, you know, facts about the world can inform what you do, but it doesn't tell you whether it's the right thing to do, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, and you can see examples in history where science overstepped its bounds and started making moral claims. And it also led to disasters, right? So like we talk about like the burning of witches or like the trial of Galileo or these examples of religion overstepping its bounds and harming people, right? That's all true, right? But on the other hand, there's a lot in science's side where it sort of oversteps its bounds and, and sort of, and, 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 you know, we just did an episode about this with the atomic bomb, right? Right. 
the atomic bomb or eugenics, yeah. um, you know, uh, IQ tests, you know, there's, you know, um, there's, there's multiple examples in history of science trying to make moral claims, race science, right? Yeah. Saying that there are specifically different races and that yeah. because and, there are different races. Yeah. yeah. And placing them in a hierarchical fashion because of their, you know, belief in that, that quote unquote science. Mm -hmm. And isn't it convenient that the white Europeans always tend to end up at the top of the hierarchy? Isn't that convenient? Um, yeah. So this is really the, the, the part of where we're getting into the heart of why I think Noma is a very valuable tool. I think it's an imperfect tool, but I think right. it's a valuable tool. Um, so what are, where I would say I think it has its limitations is, one, I do think there are times where I think science should make specific um, challenges to things. A good example of that is in medicine. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I do think that it's the prerogative of people who are doing uh, scientific work to expose the nonsense of like alternative medicine, for example, you know, things like homeopathy, which is just total bullshit, right? Um, or exposing the, the unscientific components of chiropractic medicine. Yeah. Um, cause I'm not saying that everything about chiropractic medicine is, is unscientific, but a lot, well, but it's yeah. kind of core foundations are kind of unscientific. Yeah. It, it sort of adapted some scientific, uh, things after the fact. <laughs> and, and what I can say is that like, now can the science of debunking these like problems of like, you know, non-fact-based medicine, um, or science-based medicine, that's a moral argument, right? Like you're making a moral argument about like, I think it's important for us to, to help people. And I believe in helping people because I believe in, in, in having people live good, flourishing lives. Like that's a moral argument I'm making, right? That's not a scientific mm -hmm. one. That's a moral one and that's okay. But that moral argument can be informed by whatever science you're doing. Um, and, and I think that, um, I think that's fundamentally kind of true in the sense that um, when we make claims of things of like, well, so, you know, like, well, homeopathy is harmful. Well, it's like, well, yes, it is harmful because it's bullshit, right? I mean, it's, the whole foundations of homeopathy are nonsense. This idea yeah. that that you can dilute a substance enough, and but then, it, but the more you dilute, it becomes the more powerful it becomes, which is like defies kind of like all physics. It's like weird. Um, and it's not like vaccines where like vaccines are because people people often say about homeopathy, well, it's like vaccines. It's like, well, no, vaccines are essentially a lot of times they are weakened versions of the specific virus. Yeah. Which are then which which then your body responds to and provides the an, the immune response, the autoimmune response that you need. So which, if you actually got it, it would prepare you for it. Right. Yeah. Which isn't the same as treating a fever with uh, a bit of chili in diluted 3000 times. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And so, um, you know, and I think if people want to learn more about this kind of stuff, like I highly recommend people check out the science based medicine blog that's run by like Bob Novella and, and other people. Yeah. Um, and, uh, the late great Harriet Hall, who was incredible. Um, I think she died either last year, or the year before an incredible, you know, science communicator and, and journalist who, um, did a lot of great work exposing nonsense. Um, you know, um, cause there's a lot of nonsense or, I mean, there's just a lot of bullshit. Right. And, and so my thing in the subject is, is that science has a right to criticize religion when religion tries to make science based claims yeah, and vice versa. If science tries to make moral claims and kind of step outside of its boundaries, then philosophers and moral and like ethicists have a right to say, Hey, Hey, hold on here. Like yeah. maybe we're going too fast, right? Or think about, th think through the, the um, consequences of, of science and technology. I think a good debate about that right now is, is with AI. Right. And I mean, mind you, I think it's also debatable whether these large language models are actually constitute AI. I think I would say that's, no, but <laughs> I don't think they do. I think it's mostly hype, right? Like yeah. when people say, oh, well, you can type this into a chatbot, the chatbot will give you an answer. And it's like, how is that any fundamentally different than me asking Siri something? Yeah. Or my Amazon Alexa thing to tell me something like just does a Google search, <laughs> just or just do a Google search. <laughs> Although ser yeah. Google search this these days is getting terrible. Yeah, so it's like yeah. you got to go um, to Duck, Duck, Go or something else. Yeah, yeah, you got to try something else. Um, but but yeah, so I think that's where it's very very relevant. Now, why did why did Gould write this book? 
And I think the context in which he writes this book is important. He writes this in the context of what were called the evolution wars, which sort of started in the 90s and 2000s. And it was religious fundamentalists challenging evolution in classrooms and public schools. Um, And they were trying to replace it with, first, they try to do creationism. And obviously, that's clearly not science. And the Supreme Court ruled in like the 1980s that creationism is not science and shouldn't be in a science classroom. Um, But then they sort of gave it a sort of makeover, a facelift, if you will, and they started calling it intelligent design. Um, And I think that these debates are not as big as they used to be. I I really don't, but I could be There's a lot more other stuff going on. There's a lot more other shit. There's a lot of other shit going on, Um, especially when it comes to like schools and school boards um, and libraries. It seems Um, like... It seems like the religious fundamentalists lost the intelligent design battle. And mm-hmm. as a result, they started focusing on attacking different uh, gender and sexual health and different other things. Yes, I think that's right. Um, I think that uh, there's fundamentally, when it comes to like the, the fundamentalist mind and somebody who is, who is doxastically closed, as one says, right. where they're not, um, they're not willing to entertain different ideas um, or, de- or ideas that are contradictory to their own worldview. Um, it's very hard to tell those people no. They often don't listen. Yeah. Um, and that's part of the reasons why you have to have kind of like institutions um, that, are, that sort of mediate these kinds of things. Um, because, again most religious people are not anti-science. It's, it's a very small subsection of religious yeah. people who are, um, who are sort of, you know, they're, whether they're creationists or they're flat earthers or they're anti-vaxxers. And here's the thing, right? I guarantee you out there in the world, there are also people who are secular, who are not religious at all, who are flat earthers and yep. who are anti-vaxxers. Um, you know, I mean, think of like a good example of that's like Brett Weinstein, right? Like he's not religious, yeah, but, but he's, he's like an, he's like also a pretty, wrong about everything, pretty much wrong, about everything and <laughs> is yeah. like kind of, I think known for sort of either anti-vax beliefs or sort of anti-vax adjacent. So, yeah. and sort of like, you know, COVID conspiracy theories was and it stuff. Him or was it Eric that believed they came up with a unifying <laughs> theory of everything? <laughs> that was his brother. <laughs> That was his brother. I think that's Eric. So the thing about the Weinsteins, man, or the Weinsteins or whatever, um, and uh, we're talking about the the sort of the IDW Weinsteins and not the sex pest Weinsteins. Right. Um, But uh, but yeah, I think like with with Eric Weinstein, especially like it's very hard to ever really listen to what he says like i don't i don't listen to him anymore or anything like that but when i did back in the day like whenever he was like on sam harris's podcast or something i would try to decipher exactly what the hell he was saying and i'm like what are you saying man like what are you trying to get across here you know it's like it's it's i mean jordan peterson's terrible about that but i would argue eric weinstein's worse because it's like it's it's just like word salad i mean he's like you know, Eric Weinstein's like Deepak Chopra, but for chuds, it's like I, you know, but yeah, um, yeah, yeah. gibberish, word salad, and then I have a bone to pick because we get accused by fucking people on in the YouTube comments often of of saying word salad because they don't understand the way that we explain certain things, but we're not the words we use make have meanings <laughs> right right <laughs> you know and if you're if you are um and if there's a clarifying point that you would like to ask a question about like that's fine you know because we're thinking out loud like will everything be fully like incoherent as we're discussing exactly. it's probably not but like a lot of it i hope will be fairly coherent for folks um i try to pride myself on not using too much jargoned language i try very much to be and if i'm using that kind of terms i'm defining them or explaining them um, as yeah. best I can. Um, but, uh, but l- language is limited. I mean, it's completely limited. It's very hard, you know, it's like, but, um, but especially with him, it's like, what, what's, what's your broad point here, buddy? And yeah. it's very, it's very, very tough. But, um, but I think a lot of times when it comes to religion, uh, I think that most people, 
I think they have kind of an intuitive sense that like religion has its own sphere and does its own thing. And science kind of has its own sphere and does its own thing. And that if there are sort of collisions, because there are going to be collisions, it's best that we work at them out so that we, we give sort of equal respect to both of them, even if we disagree with one or the other. Like I'm an atheist, like I'm not religious, but like right. I very much believe in, in what Gould did, which is we treat them as two separate spheres and we treat them as equal spheres in the sense that they both um, should be provided um, equal protections under sort of notions of a free and open discussion of concepts. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, what's granted to science in terms of um, credibility or, um, or prestige or whatever, you would grant to religion, not because it's right, but because it's like that is religion means a lot to people. And it's, yeah. it's something where, yeah, you may not believe it, but a lot of people do. And like, it's like, and so it's very important. And that goes for science too, right? Like there's stuff that we believe about science that a lot of people don't. Yeah. Um, uh, like people don't think the moon landing happened, like I said, or people, <laughs> they were flat earthers or whatever. Um, although the flat earth thing is, I guess, a little overblown. He's a good chapter in this about how, um, like ancients knew that the earth was round, like, yep. you know, and this whole idea of the earth being flat, that was like a part of the dark ages. It was like, a, this was a product of like the late eight night, like the late 19th century, like the late 1800s where Pythagoras knew that the earth was yeah. round. So did Aristotle, <laughs> like so did Aquinas, like they all knew, like people, in, most people in the middle ages believed that the earth was round. They didn't think yeah. the earth was flat. Um, and uh, it's a story we tell about, because like one of the myths is that Christopher Columbus was like the one who, like he's the one who, who popped people out of that right. notion that he's the one yeah. who, you know, let people know that the earth is round. It's like, well, no, people centuries before him knew that, millennia knew that before him, one, right. and two, he also like in his cartography of the earth in his mapping out of the earth, he made the earth, his projections of the size of the earth were smaller than it actually was. Yeah, that's right. And, and he didn't know that North America existed. So he bumps into it. Right. So like Columbus was a dumbass, like from beginning right. to end, who, who, who kind of conned his way into getting a patronage from, you know, Queen Isabella of Spain and goes on his little trips. Right. But like, yeah. And part of the, the sort of the Christopher Columbus love or the people the, the people who kind of celebrate him, that really comes out of the Italian American community in the United States. Like in Indiana, we have a statue of uh, Christopher Columbus at the Indiana State House. It was put there in the 1920s. Right. Um, Columbus Day became far more of a thing because of Italian Americans, because it was like that was their guy. Like you could say, here, he's one of our heroes. Um, here's one of our people who you know had a significant contribution or whatever. Um, and by contribution, they mean, you know, the mass enslavement and murder of native. It's people. really too bad. That's the guy yeah. they picked. <laughs> right. Um, you know, cause I think John Oliver did a bit about this where it's like, well, you could pick other people I and mean, you could pick like Frank Sinatra. You could pick, yeah. um, you There's know, lots you of wonderful Italian American, wonderful people. Italian Americans, you know, like you could pick, uh, you know, the late James Gandolfini, you could pick, you know, oh, yeah. uh, 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 Al Pacino, like, you know, there's certain things you could, you know, you could say or whatever, but, um, pick somebody yeah. worthwhile to look up to <laughs> somebody look worthwhile to look up to. Exactly. And so he's writing this in the context of people making very clear, um, attacks upon public education and science education in particular. And so what he's saying is, is that if you have religious beliefs, under, understand that they're not science and they don't belong in a science classroom. Right. Um, and I think that's fairly common sense. I think most Americans and most religious people would, would accept that. Yeah. Um, and uh, but the, but but there is this divide between the sort of fundamentalists, um, you know, what we would call sort of the Christian nationalists today, because that's kind of what they are, you know, um, and. Uh, the dominionists, the people who think that America is a Christian nation should be a Christian nation. Um, and, you know, it's disastrous. It's absolutely disastrous for democracy. Yeah. And I think that's part of the, the sort of what he's trying to do. So he has a great quote about this where he talks about, because a lot of times critics of him will say, oh, well, this is just political correctness or, oh, this is just, you know, fence sitting or whatever. And, and he makes, he actually kind of calls this point out. He says, 
Noma is no wimpish, wallpapering, superficial device acting as a mere diplomatic fiction and smokescreen to make life more convenient by compromise in a world of diverse and contradictory passions. Noma is a proper and principled solution based on sound philosophy to an issue of great historical and emotional weight. Noma is tough-minded. Noma forces dialogue and respectful discourse about different primary commitments. Noma does not say, I'm okay, you're okay, so let's just avoid any talk about science and religion. That's right. So he, he, he says flat out, like these creationists who are like trying to like come into school boards, like they're violating Noma. And by violating it, they're violating um, our core tenets of the value of, of, of science education. Like they are actively yeah. undermining the scientific project. Um, and when people make like crazy assumptions, like especially like in Silicon Valley or whatever about like, well, if we do gene editing, we can like you know do these kinds of things. We can make people more moral through gene editing or whatever. And it's like right. that's not a claim you can make. No. You you can't. Like that's not you know because humans are much more than just genes. We yeah. are products of very vastly different things, including like just nurture, right? Like our own experiences. Because there are people who could you know, based on their genetic, you know, makeup or whatever could be classified as autistic or sociopathic or something like that, that doesn't actually make them autistic or sociopathic. Not, I'm right. not saying those two things are, are equivocal. I'm just right. as an example. Right. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but, you know, but it's not exactly a one-to-one. -one. So that's yeah. an example of science kind of overstepping its boundaries and making moral claims when it can't. And you have to right. step in and go like, no, you're trying to make a moral argument that's not science. Yeah. And it's the same thing with these creationists. No, you're trying to make a religious argument and that's not science. That's religion. And that's fine. If you want to believe that, that's totally cool, but it's not science. And so yeah. what he's, so his thing is not some sort of fence sitting position. It's basically saying that when religious people violate Noma by stepping in where they don't belong, specifically in regards to science, you call them out for it. And you say, you don't belong here. You're yeah. making claims about stuff that you can't make because it's a religious, you are trying to graft religion on a science and you can't do that yeah. because religion is not science. Yeah. Do we have any comments by the we way? Have, yeah, we actually have a few here. Uh, okay. I'll go back a little bit. Um, <laughs> we started talking about the book and uh, some random geek said, oh, this is a book review show. I thought this was just a political and current events show. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um. Uh, Velkin 999 asked if this was the Tom Cruise movie we were talking about. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the <laughs> Rock of Ages. Rock of Ages, yeah. yeah. Which we'd, we were talking about in the pregame, we were talking about hair metal quite a bit. Yeah, we did. We talked about <laughs> metal and professional yeah. wrestling a little bit. So that's in the pregame. Yeah, we mentioned, we mentioned the, the creationists who try to mash uh, science with religion, as Velkin 999 yes. mentioned. That's exactly right. And it's wrong. It's wrong to do that. In fact, the Catholic Church, even in the 1950s, knew that this was wrong. So a good example of this is Pope Pius XII wrote something called Humani Generi, um, where he basically lays out that evolution is probably true uh, based on what we know. Yeah. And by the time that you get into the 90s, when Pope John Paul II is Pope, it's unequivocal. Like, yes, yeah, evolution, evolution is, is just accepted. It's yeah. just accepted fact. Um, and the church also apologized to Galileo in the 1990s too. Um, so yeah. Um, so it's like, so like Pope Pius the 12th and 50s sort of begrudgingly says, well, evolution's probably true. Uh, but we can't rule it out. We can't rule out, uh, that it's false completely yet or whatever, but it might be. Whereas like by the time you get to John Paul II, he's like, no, it's true. It's true. Now, again, yeah. I want to preface this that like most Americans are not Catholics. Most Americans right. are some form of Protestant or yeah. they're non-religious. And so Protestants are not Catholics. Most creationists, I would, I would go pretty so far as to say that I would say most, if not all cr creationists are Protestants yeah. of some form or yeah. flavor. They're not Catholics. Um, yeah, for sure. You got your uh, fundamentalist evangelical Baptists. That's yep. Yeah, apostolics, <laughs> Pentecostals, yeah. Uh, Nonsequently is, is watching over on uh, Twitch. Well, hello. Uh, thank you. Kareem Mays is over on YouTube. Hi. Thanks for being and, here. And then uh, well, Nonsequently said, chiropractors make me nervous. And I think that's fully yes, fair. Yes, they do. I, 
I think it's absolutely fair. Um, so, uh, I mean, I will go. So, I mean, chiropractic medicine is bullshit. Like, it's total bullshit. It was made up by somebody who wasn't a doctor. His name is Daniel David Palmer. He was a fucking grocer and like a religious fanatic yeah. who had no medical training whatsoever. And uh, Penn and Teller did a great episode about alternative medicine on, of, of their episode of bullshit where they talked about um, the history of chiropractic medicine because chiropractic is very weird. Um, as they say in that episode, it treats the body like a human voodoo doll, which I think is true. They're basically, like the, the whole, the, the basic core, like belief of chiropractic medicine is that health problems that you have are a result of misalignments of the spine. Yeah. And by realigning the spine through manipulations, we can fix your health issues, yeah. which kind of is weird. Like we don't treat the body like that. Like the body is like a holistic system. It, you know, it, if you just manipulate the spine, it doesn't solve my fucking allergies. Like it's not, that's not how that works. Yeah. You get the same thing with like a reflexology or, uh, you know, any kind of like medical claims that speci specify this is where it all comes from. Yeah. And so it's very vague, you know, chiropractic medicine, like anybody who is practicing chiropractic, like if they say doctor so-and-so, like they're not a real doctor. Like if you, if you have a doctor of chiropractic, you're not a real doctor. Like, I'm sorry. Yeah. You're just you not. You didn't go to medical school. <laughs> you didn't go to medical school, medical school. You went to chiropractic school. Yeah. Um, and, um, Granted, I, uh, I don't want to say that it's all bunk because I yeah. know that there's some surgeons and some like uh, people who are like legit doctors who mm -hmm. respect certain things that are done in chiropractic practice. Absolutely. And peer reviewed science indicates that that chiropractic is useful for the alleviation of lower back pain. Yeah. So like we know that there are certain things in relation to back pain in which chiropractic medicine does work. but I would argue that you could get those same effects from either a massage therapist yes. or a medically trained physical therapist. So yes. um, I've done physical therapy for my neck and my back because I have neck and back issues and head issues. Um, I do physical therapy every single day. Um, I, once a week, I go to a place uh, and I have physical therapy done where they manipulate me and move me around. And it helps me a lot in terms of strengthening my muscles. Because that's the thing, right? Physical therapy is more about strengthening your muscles to alleviate pain yeah. rather than the cracking your spine. Yeah. And uh, I mean, not, I, I guess it's, we're kind of a little bit of far afield, but yeah, chiropractic, if done improperly, can literally cause strokes. Yes. It can so. kill you. Like it's, it's, it, it can absolutely kill you. Um, and it's, it's, it's wrong. Like I think that chiropractic, like it's core beliefs, like it's core propositions of what it's medical. I'm putting that big quotes here. Medical, yeah. be, like medical beliefs are its core tenets are fundamentally flawed. Yeah. So like it's alleviation of lower back pain is basically a side effect. It's not what chiropractic is supposed to do, but right. it's something that can help you. I've never been to a chiropractor and I will never, ever go to a chiropractor because they're not oh. doctors. Yeah. They're I, not doctors. I, I go see a massage therapist yep. regularly, but I, do, I, I will never yeah. go to a chiropractor. <laughs> and I do physical therapy too. And like, and there are benefits to both of those. They're limited, but there are true benefits to those. Um, you know, uh, but a lot of stuff like, Physical therapy is great. If they start getting into like the Reiki or like dry needling shit, that's when you got to be like, mm, no, because I've done dry needling like for my neck. Oh, okay. doesn't help the yeah. jack shit. Uh, you know, so, um, you know, but again, that's my own experience. I'm a sample of one, right? What I'm telling right. you is not necessarily science. This is not peer reviewed. I'm just some fucker. Anecdotes on aren't science. Anecdotes are not science. <laughs> um, and so, like, you know, re learn about this stuff for yourself. Like, I highly recommend people check out the science, the, the science based medicine blog. It's incredible. There's great pieces on there about chiropractic medicine. There's a great there's a lot of great pieces like debunking COVID myths, like and misinformation um, by reputable doctors and yeah. medical professionals um, who know what they're talking about. So definitely check that out, too. Um, but yeah, I think to kind of tie it back to Noma, like chiropractic medicine is something where it's like kind of stepping where it doesn't belong. It's yeah. it's uh it's kind of folkways bullshit that is kind of dressed up in the veneer of science, but it's not really science. Right. Uh so we also I guess uh 
a couple more recent uh, comments. Uh, Velkin999 sure. said that there was that chiropractor who was doing work on a giraffe recently. Oh, my God. <laughs> Which, how the fuck would they know it worked? Yeah, you have like, no idea. How would you know? Like, this is the, it's kind of like the, the animal psychics. Like, is there animal psychics? They can say whatever can, they want. They, they can talk to animals. Like, <laughs> say whatever the fuck they want. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it, it, you know, I mean, it's, it's crazy shit. How, I mean, I, how do I know? Crazy shit. How do we know it just it up? <laughs> I mean, how would you even go about confirming whether anything worked? You couldn't. Yeah. I mean, I you really couldn't, right? Because that's the thing about medicine, right? Is medicine in some respects is a very like objective evidence-based science, but like medicine's also kind of subjective, right? Like if, if you have treatments done and they're like, you know, on a scale of one to 10, how do you feel? Right. It's like, they can't like put me in the machine and measure my level of pain. That's not really how it works. Right. They can show me problems with my body that might lead to me having pain, but they can't say, well, the pain meter says that you have 500 pain points. Like it no, doesn't work like that. Pain is, pain is tactically subjective. It's very subjective because some people can handle pain better than others. In terms of pain, I'm a wuss, total wuss. I'm a total baby. My wife, super tough. She's much tougher than me. <laughs> uh, and, um, but, uh, you know, so, but here's the other thing too, right? And, the, and these kind of subjective things have led to serious bias in medicine. For example, in relationship to African-Americans who, yes. who are, there's this myth that African-Americans feel pain less than white people. Right. Um, that's a myth. That's not true, but that's a pervasive myth that yeah. exists that leads to people not getting treatment. Same with uh, fat phobia, right? That a lot of times underlying health problems don't get treated because your doctor will keep saying to you, oh, you're fat, yeah. get your weight off first, and then we'll talk about the other stuff, right? And, uh, you know, like the problem sometimes with medicine too, and, and doctor's experiences, I know Aubrey Gordon's talked a lot about this, um, is... A lot of times your health problems lead to you being fat and not like the other way around. Right. Like it's not that you're fat and you have health problems. You have health problems, which lead to the unintended consequences of you putting on weight because maybe you're yep. physically disabled and you can't work out yep. or you have chronic pain or chronic illness that precludes you from eating a healthy meal every day. Like certain things like that. Right. Yeah. And then sometimes like life is just fucking hard and you want to have like a, you have like, want to have a big soda, you want to have a Twix and you want to feel a little bit better. Like, cause sometimes that shit makes you feel better. Right. Yeah. I, that, I eat you know. so much candy and junk food. It's a good thing. I have a physical job or else I, <laughs> Oh my God, dude, I'll tell you, man, like the, the pandemic, like I lost a lot of weight and I gained a lot of the weight back during the pandemic. And I got a sweet tooth during the pandemic before mm -hmm. pandemic. I wasn't really much of a sweets guy. I'd have a candy bar every once in a while, whatever. But generally, I was more of a savory dude. But I like sweets now. It's it's terrible. But but like there's a great there's a great part of George Orwell's classic book, The Road to Wigan Pier, which is this book about coal miners in Britain, where people used to complain about the coal miners going out when they'd get their paychecks and they'd buy candy or cigarettes or shit that was bad for them or beer or whatever, and and the the. And the upper class, the people who were writing those checks or whatever, they'd be like, well, why can't the poor eat more healthy? You know, like in my best bourgeois accent or whatever. <laughs> why can't they be more like us or whatever? Not to mention the fact that those rich people were eating like shit with lard and butter in it or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And they were having more sugar than anybody. But it's like when you work in a coal mine, it's a very impressive, hard job. You know, you can be... You can be killed on the job. You can permanently in injured or disabled on the job. And back then there was no workers comp. There was no unemployment insurance. Like you were fucked. Right. Yep. And so it's a very precarious life and a very hard life. And so a lot of times you would want to have things to make you feel better and just get you through the week because life was often hard. You know, I think that's why a lot of people have unhealthy relationships with alcohol or opiates or food or Yep. You know, or sex or whatever, right? It's um, because we're all trying to just get through another day living in the hellscape that is capitalism. Yep. And uh, yeah. Um, do we have any other comments? Yes. Uh, regarding uh, physical therapy, Mothwings mm -hmm. said uh, physical ther therapy, greater sign, whatever medieval torture chiropractor WWE move they chose <laughs> for the day. <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly, right? Because physical therapists are often trained, right? They're physical, they're trained physical therapists or they're kinesiologists yeah. or they're exercise, like they're, 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 they specialize in this. 
Um, and they're gonna, you're going to get a better result from them. The problem is, is that doing physical therapy is more expensive than going to the chiropractor. Right. I think here's like my, my little theory, and maybe we've talked about this before. I think part of the reason why, especially in America, but in other parts of the world, why alternative medicine is such a, a big industry is because we don't have universal health care. That people can't just go and get physical therapy without it bankrupting them. Um, I think if people had the option between going to a fucking chiropractor in a strip mall and going to a physical therapist, I think most people would choose the physical therapist. Right. But because it's so prohibitively expensive, and I can tell you, I'm still paying off the medical bills me doing physical therapy last year and the year before. Right. I can tell you it's not cheap. Um, uh, that um, they, they do these cheaper options because it's cheaper just to go to the chiropractor or it's cheaper to go to the reflexologist or it's cheaper to go to, you know, some Reiki healer motherfucker. Like it's, you know, whatever. Um, yep. Even though in the long run, it's not because they're going to constantly want you to keep coming back. That's right. Because yeah. the goal of physical therapy is at some point to basically have you be done. You sort of graduate and you do exercises every day. But yeah. This, that was the the a real gr- great thing about my massage therapist is I had to mm-hmm. go every two weeks for my mm-hmm. back. And she said, well, the goal here is that eventually you'll be able to come for like a relaxation massage once every two or three months. Like we don't want you coming back every two weeks to fix this problem. <laughs> yes. Yes. And that's the thing, right? It's so... Yeah, I mean, I think that alternative alternative medicine is a great example of like a violation of NOMA. It's kind of stepping in where it doesn't belong because yeah. homeopathy or chiropractic or reflexology, all of these are making specific scientific. It's They're trying to make what seems to be scientific claims when in reality, they're more sort of like metaphysical or religious claims. Mm-hmm. And that's fine. It's like you want to believe that that's fine, but it's not science. Like it's yeah. it's that's not science. Um, uh, there was a couple comments about, uh, the chiropractors again, like, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the giraffe guy is making a lot of, <laughs> Vulcan 999 says he's making bank. That's true. That's absolutely true. Because it's like, it's like the pet psychic. How can you tell them they're wrong? Yeah, that's right. Uh, Mothwings also said, not to mention dog chiros. Yes. Um, and I think that, that if an adult consents to a chiropractic treatment, that's on them. Like, I mean, I, I can't tell them no. My big issue is when chiropractors do work on people who cannot consent. Yeah. And specifically animals and children. Children. Yeah. Especially children. Um, in the Penn and Teller episode on alternative medicine, they have a clip of like a chiropractor. I can't watch like, that part. It's hard. Like, it's okay. horrible. Yeah. Um, where he's like cracking the back of a small child and you can hear it crunch. Yeah. You're like, you're not supposed to do that to a, to a six year old child. Like they don't, yeah. their bones aren't even fully formed yet. Like, what are you, what are you doing? Yeah. And they do that to like, like even babies and stuff too. It's, it's horrible. Like, yeah. It's horrible. So that's my issue is like, if I see going to the pr- chiropractor, like smoking weed, if you want to smoke weed, that's totally cool. But you don't, but don't bring it into my house. Don't force me to smoke your weed and don't force people who can't consent to it to smoke weed. That's the same thing with chiropractic shit. Like, I mean, ideally I'd like to live in a world where chiropractic didn't exist because it's bullshit, but like, and then we have universal healthcare so that people wouldn't go to the fucking chiropractor. Yeah. Um, Because think about it, right? Like chiropractic medicine is often covered by insurance, which is ridiculous. It should never be in cover like that and homeopathy and none of that should be covered by insurance, yeah. acupuncture, none of it. Um, except for very specific cases in which it's been proved that it does something like, it's like very frustrating that all of that stuff is covered by insurance, but I have a limit of $600 for my frigging counselor. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's terrible. <laughs> like what? It's fuck? terrible. And it's part of it is, Oh boy, we might go down the rabbit hole a little bit. So we'll, uh, okay, I'll say this briefly. So in the 1990s, there was a law that was called, that was passed, I think it was called the Complementary and Alternative Health Act of like 1993 or like 1994, something like that. And what it did was it wildly deregulated what we think of as the alternative health industry. So right. it wildly deregulated supplements. Yep. Um, and alternative health treatments. And it paved the way for alternative health treatments to be covered by insurance. Um, and fortunately, some of them are fighting back. Like the NHS, um, the National Health Service in Britain has made a determination. I think they made this a few years ago. Um, uh, you can 
I would look it up to get the exact date, but I know that they basically stopped covering homeopathy in the NHS. Yeah. They, either they stopped covering homeopathy or they're in the process of doing that or, or people are campaigning for them to stop um, uh, covering homeopathy. Uh, and really the two guys who were pushing that in the Senate were a guy, uh, Senator Tom Harkin of, of Iowa and Senator Orrin Hatch of Utah. Fucking Orrin oh, Hatch, eh? Orrin Hatch, man. Like, I just, I finished the Reaganland book and, and he talked, because Hatch was elected to the Senate for the first time in 1976. Oof. The Senate a very long time. Yeah. I, mean, I think he's dead now, but, and, and Tom Harkin was in the Senate for a very, very long time. But these guys, they were the largest recipients of, of campaign contributions from the supplement industry. Of course. Um, and so they kind of in the 90s with this complementary and alternative health act, um, they deregulated the industry. Um, the other thing that's interesting, and I learned this from the maintenance phase podcast, is that um, wellness programs in the United States, at least in the United States, I can't speak for other countries, but wellness programs like your like I have one for work. It's called active health where you get like if you do certain actions, like it tracks my steps and stuff like that, I can get money. Okay. Uh, wellness programs are not regulated at all. Oh. So they don't have to be under under federal law. They don't have to be at all. So they can make they can do things that are in any in any reasonable metric would be considered discrimination. So, for example, in my wellness program, there's like a diet. Like there's like a a pre diabetes like program that you can do, which includes a weight loss portion, and you only get the reward if you lose a certain amount of weight. Mm -hmm. Now, if that was in any other component of your job, that would be considered discrimination. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and you couldn't do that. But in but in these wellness programs, you can because they're not regulated. It's the Wild West. They can be whatever they want. Right. Um, so, yeah, that's this is the problem of not having healthcare be decommodified and, a, and, and, and an unreserved universal public good. That, that's you get this terrible stuff. Yeah, for sure. Um, a couple more comments. Um, <laughs> uh, Vilka999 said, that's a great posh accent. <laughs> oh, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Some I random tried. geek said, black folks don't feel as much pain. That was just pure white supremacy to justify whipping enslaved folks. 100%. Absolutely. And it was a way of discriminating against them. At, even after slavery, it was a way of discriminating against them in medical situations. It was a form of, it was sort of an implicit form of Jim Crow too. Yeah. 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 That's right. Yeah. And it, it, it continues to have negative effects on people all yeah. right up until today. So. Yes, it does. Bemke watches Buffy said Orwell isn't my favorite socialist, but he's my favorite to cite as a socialist. Yeah. I think he's the one that most people, if you cite him, people will be like, oh, okay. Um, he's the one you can kind of get away with. There's certain ones you can get away with where if you say it and and you kind of talk about socialism kind of indirectly, people go like, oh, okay, okay. Um, he's one. Einstein is one. Right. Um, Helen Keller is another one because Helen Keller was okay. a socialist. I didn't know that. Um, and yeah, so like there's certain things where, yeah, you can kind of get away with it. Yeah. No, Orwell has a very complicated legacy, but an interesting yeah. one. Yeah. Um, some random geek said, uh, one time in history that had the lowest amount of alcohol consumption was during the Spanish anarchist in, uh, Catalonia during 1936 to 1939, when the workers were in control of things. Yes, this is a great, that's a great, and there point. was no capitalism. <laughs> that's a great point. Thank you for sharing that. That's interesting. Um, I did not know that. That's fascinating. And finally, wait, chiropractic medicine is covered by health insurance, but mental health isn't. What a great country we're in. Yeah, this is true, right? So like some health plans cover chiropractic. I'm not saying all of them do, but some do. I think mine does, which is Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield. But um, but some do, some don't. Some cover acupuncture, some cover cupping, some cover... Um, uh, those are kind of the main ones. Any Anything outside of that, we are like doing like, I don't know, like Reiki and stuff. They may not cover that, but they might. Yeah. Um, TT or therapeutic touch, I don't think they cover, but like it just, you know, I think that um, it's kind of wild. And yeah, mental health is covered terribly in America. I mean, part of that is in the United States, like health, health insurance is broken up into different components. So like I have health insurance for like my body, but then I also have separate insurance for my eyes and my teeth. Right. So like you pay for those separately, um, which is I make the joke that in America, teeth are luxury bones. Yeah. Um, 
But uh, so it's similar. It's similar in Canada. We have quote unquote okay. universal health care, but then mm-hmm. you have to get insurance for your teeth and your eyes and your brain and your. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you know? And that's how it is in the United States. So like if you're on Medicare, for example, and this is a point that Bernie kept making when he was running for president. And it's true that um, that Medicare doesn't cover like uh, uh, hearing aids. It doesn't cover eyeglasses and it doesn't cover dental. Yeah. So you have to buy supplement insurance to to cover those things, and it's like, well, I didn't, I did not, you know, I, I didn't choose <laughs> to have teeth. It's like part right. of just being a human being. Like eyes and teeth kind of go with the package. Yeah. Um. So just having two ears, health, but whatever. So it's it's very weird, but part of that is the way that health insurance developed in the United States. It was a way of being able to provide additional wages during World War II when there were wage and price controls, and so. You could say, "Well, I'm paying you ten dollars uh, uh, an hour, but I'm also paying you three dollars in, in 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 benefits." It was a way yeah. of being able to skirt around the the, the regulatory part of that. Um, but and over time, like in early earlier times, like your employer would cover the vast majority of it under the plans, mm. um, because very large employers, it's a much larger risk pool. So it's a lot easier to cover people. Yeah. Um, Whereas like today, like it's kind of a balance where you pay some things and you pay other things and whatever, um, you know, and you have co-pays, you have deductibles, you have premiums, you have to kind of neg- navigate all of that stuff. <laughs> um, it's a real pain in the ass. I mean, it's, Sounds you like know, it. and it's really expensive too. I mean, the thing that's crazy is people always talk about like the big price tag for Medicare for all. And it's like, well, guys, think about it. Health insurance is what we refer to as a private tax. Yeah. It's, it's not. It's not something you see in your tax rolls, but you pay when, when you're paying healthcare premiums. That's essentially a tax, right? Yeah. Wouldn't it be better if you just paid those premiums as a part of your taxes, and then you just got universal coverage, the way that most industrial countries do it? Like, yeah. it's it's very very odd, and you know, it's America is that we are such a weird outlier. We're exceptional in all of the bad ways. <laughs> um, yeah, that's right. But yeah. So that's it for comments. Is are we? Have anything else to talk about for the book? Yeah, I just want to say that I think that um, in general, I kind of wanted to finish with discussing um, kind of the the decline of new atheism and kind of the new atheism's influence on the way that we conceive of this book and the way that people talk about this book. Um, and I feel like they really did people a disservice by yeah. sort of grossly kind of misrepresenting what Nomo was and what Gould was trying to get across. Um, as some kind of weaselly kind of middle ground fence sitting right. thing, which it's not. Um, and uh, I just think about it as the separation of science and religion, very much like there's the separation of church and state. There's a separation of church and lab. Um, and I think that that's the way I kind of think about it. Um, and I think using the phrase non overlapping magisteria kind of like kind of gives it kind of a foofy language, you know, for those of us who say we say word salad, that just means that there's two different spheres and they don't overlap, that one yeah. is one and one is the other. And when they encroach upon each other, it's a problem. That's what that means. Hopefully that's clear. In the Venn diagram uh, of science and religion, they shouldn't touch. They shouldn't touch. <laughs> they might be right up next to each other, but they don't touch. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's a great. Uh, I think it's a great little book. I mean, Stephen Jay Gould was a wonderful writer. I mean, he wrote his, I think, nat- nat- natural history column for decades. Um, he he um, died in 2002, um, fairly young. Um, but he was an excellent scientist, excellent science communicator. Um, and he was on the political left. Uh, you yeah. know, he was a part of the, the sort of left-wing biologists like him and Richard Lewontin, who were challenging a lot of the sort of biological determinism out of the, the 1970s of people like Dawkins and E.O. Wilson. Um, and uh, Lewontin was a Marxist, like I, like he, right. without a doubt. Um, I think Gould was sort of Marxist adjacent, although I think he, he sort of thought of himself loosely as a Marxist, but at the very least he was on the political left. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I think it's great. Um, this will be one of two books we're going to cover of Gould in our time with Red Reviews. Sometime next year, we're going to do his book, um, The Mismeasure of Man, where oh, we yeah. sort of his classic book, which debunks like race science and IQ yeah. and eugenics and shit. It's 
You know, it's the definitive refutation of the bell curve. Leave it to Gould to write a refutation of a book before the book was written. Right. Because like he yeah. put out The Mismeasure of Man like a decade before the bell curve came out. We'll talk about like the bell curve debates. That'll be sometime um, next year. But but I think Gould was, was a great champion of science and a great champion of humanism um, and somebody that of of kind of our bent, people who are sort of secular, I think he's somebody that we can be kind of proud of, um, who who um, I think if he was alive today would have a lot of criticisms of people like Dawkins and, 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 Harris, and, and, and yeah. Harris and all those guys. I think he would have been very critical of the new atheism um, and would have had, a, I think he probably, and it's when in a weird way, this book is kind of a refutation of new atheism written before it, new atheism became a thing, which is kind of fascinating. Um, not saying that Stephen Jay Gould is a prophet. That would be far out of reach of Noma. <laughs> but, um, but I think it's, I think he was a very prescient guy. And I think Noma is a very good way of thinking about the, the sort of the so-called war between science and religion. Right on. So I guess, uh, quickly before, uh, we finish up, uh, hello, Susan. Sorry. Uh, you Hi, came Susan. in late. Oh yeah, no worries. Um, you can certainly catch the replay on YouTube and then, uh, Corey later on will come out with the cool edited version, which has like graphics and all fun stuff. So, <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, Mothwings says, I'm peace out and work on a battle jacket. That sounds really cool. That sounds very <laughs> nice, <laughs> but thank you for joining us. Thank you and... so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. And I guess that leaves us. What are we covering next time? Next time. So um, I've heard you all and I, 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 we are doing, we are finally going to do a deep dive and, on degrowth. We're going to talk about degrowth next time. Very cool. I'm, I'm very excited about it. Um, I think that uh, we're going to be talking about Jason Hickel's book, Less is More, next time. Nice. Um, which is an excellent book. And I think that, um, I think if degrowth is what Jason Hickel says it is, then I'm a degrother. Okay. Uh, uh, I would say that I think it changes my mind. I think if 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 what he thinks of as that is what it is, then yes, I'm all for it. I'm excited uh, to hear um, hear you go in depth on that one. So I think it's it's a great book. I really look forward to kind of unpacking it. For sure. Right on. And I guess that just leaves us with where can people find you. So people can find me at uh, justinclark.org. The website's right down there. Um, that's where you can find all episodes of the podcast, including some of my other writing. Uh, I'm currently working on an article for the Untold Indiana blog about um, the Studebaker electric car that they introduced in 1902. Oh, wow. Um, so uh, Studebaker made electric cars. Studebaker was a very iconic Indiana-based car manufacturer. I've done research on them for a historical marker we're putting up. And uh, they made electric cars. Um, and there's this great story of uh, a electric car and a gas-fueled car doing a race through the streets of Philadelphia in like 1908. And the electric car won. And not only did the electric car won, but the electric car that won was driven by a woman, which is kind of cool. Um, and she uh, was not just somebody who owned one. She was a dealer. She sold them, which was kind of oh, neat. Wow. It's pretty neat for a woman to be selling electric cars in 1902. 1908. Oh, yeah, 1908. Yeah. So I'm going to be working on that. Um, and then um, maybe sometime down the line, I'm going to start reading... Um, uh, Slavoj Žižek's new book, Christian Atheism, and maybe okay. I'll do an essay on it or we'll cover it on the show because um, I think it's interesting and kind of uh, I've always found his take on Christianity to be very, very, very interesting. Um, but uh, but yeah, okay. so those would be the things. And then you can always follow me on social media at uh, Justin Clark, PH. Um, PH stands for public history. Um, and then, of course, as always, please consider becoming a patron. Uh, Patreon.com forward slash skeptical leftist. Um, you get access to all the pre-games, the post-games, um, all the excellent content that Corey does outside of Red Reviews, including excellent interviews um, and his uh, podcast with his partner. Um, and so definitely check all of that out um, and consider becoming a patron. Corey does a lot of hard work to make this show possible. Uh, we recently just lost a couple patrons, so a couple more coming back in. Even That would be, would be great. Oh, yes. Yes, that would be great. Please consider becoming a patron. Right on. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to everybody who watched or listened. Yes. And, uh, thank you for thank your comments. You. As usual, thank you, Justin. Thank you, Corey. It's always a pleasure.
All right, folks, that's all for now. Thanks for watching or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends or on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. I really appreciate it and it helps me keep the power on. Thanks to my top patrons, Damian Marie at Hope, uh, Some Random Geek, Justin Clark, Dan F. Smith, and Lisa Glass. And thank you to my new patrons. You can stay tuned for the list of patrons at the end to see your name listed. If you aren't a patron and want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can send a one-time donation to buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. I also have a Substack where you can subscribe for free or you can donate per month. And lastly, you can get a paid subscription on Spotify that will give you the same access to bonus content and extra long episodes. If you can't contribute financially, then I would like on YouTube or a five-star rating on a, and a review on Apple Podcasts or one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser would be great. If you want to find more from me, then make sure to check out the show notes for links to all my stuff or check out my link tree. That's linktr.ee slash skeptical leftist. That's where you can find all of my social media spaces and communities. You can also email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening or watching. Make sure to leave a comment on the video. Join your local org, print off some posters or pamphlets, and spread the propaganda. Also, stick around for a clip from this episode's post-show chat. I know everybody in Canada got up in arms because Justin Trudeau made a law that said you can't single use plastics are banned. So you got to find alternative sources. But that shit literally like, why are we creating millions and millions of plastic bags? you know, just to be thrown in the fucking landfill. Yeah. That shit doesn't make any sense, honestly. It's absurd. There's a great organization that I follow on Instagram called The Ocean Cleanup. Um, okay. And they're a nonprofit, like collaborative, who built these amazing technologies that clean up shit in like oceans and rivers and, right. and deltas. And like, and when you watch these videos, they're very satisfying because they're getting all this shit out of this these waters. And these waters look beautiful after they, all this crap's taken out of them. But when you look at what they've pulled out of there, the vast majority of it is fucking plastic. Yeah. It's dangerous. And, yeah, that's right. It's super, super dangerous.